Hello and welcome to Water Cooler. I'm Nick Cater, the head of the Menzies Research Centre, and my guest today is a woman who is the hope of the side for Liberal voters in Canberra in the ACT. She became leader of the opposition uh, last October uh, when the party lost its sixth election in a row. Uh, but we're here to talk about the future, not the past. Elizabeth Lee, welcome to Water Cooler. Hello, and thanks for having me, Nick. Now, um, Canberra, of course, is a public service town and therefore tends to vote more Labour, more Green than the rest of the country. Uh, it may be an obvious question, but why is it, do you think, that public servants seem to prefer a Labour Party government, Labour Green government? I think that, um, well, first of all, I want to actually put um, a, a challenge to the fact that it's a Cam Canberra is a public service town. I think that Canberra does have so much more to offer and uh, it really it should be, as the national capital, uh, a city that is befitting of the pride of Australia, but also a home to so many people with a diversity of experiences and passions. And uh, whilst, of course, our public service uh, and the public servants play a massive role in our city, it also is, uh, you know, a great university it's a town. It also is the home of a lot of innovation and research and development, and uh, it can be so much more. I think that um, you're right, though, you know, if you look at the statistics, and uh, we have just come off our sixth election loss, um, you know, you can't fight those stats. It is it is what it is and it's something that I'm very conscious of. But at the same time, I'm very hopeful. I think that, um, you know, we show a very, very good diverse team that we bring to the public. And uh, I know that uh, we've got what it takes to show the Canberra public that they deserve a Canberra Liberals government come 2024. Now, you and I have got something in common. We're both migrants to this country, like probably a third of the country almost. Um, I always think every migrant has a fascinating story, but we're here to talk about you, of course. So tell me your story. How did you, what was your journey from South Korea, where you were born, to where you are now? I was seven and my younger sister Rosa was five when my parents decided to migrate to Australia. And the reason that they did was because they wanted us to grow up in a country that had a wider view of the world. A country that, um, I suppose at the time, because Korea was uh, still a very homogenous uh, society and they wanted us to experience the world, um, a, a global world, and that's why they brought us here for uh, better opportunities and, uh, you know, having two daughters uh, and uh, a university system that was probably out of reach for us if we remained in Korea. They wanted us to, uh, you know, spread our wings and explore the world uh, in a global way and uh, that's why they brought us to Australia. It was very difficult as, as most migrants experience when they move to a new country. I mean, for my parents who left behind their family and friends, they left behind a culture and a language that they know and to start afresh in a new country where they don't look like anybody else, mm -hmm. where they don't understand the language, where they don't understand the culture. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult, but they made a lot of sacrifices. And I've always said to my younger sisters, my youngest sister having been born in Australia, that if we don't succeed and make the most of our lives here in Australia, then the sacrifices that my parents made will all come to naught. And that's something that I think deep down drives all three of us. For almost all migrants, right, you're starting from scratch, aren't you? I mean, I, I wrote in my, my book, The Lucky Culture, as a description of arriving in Australia, and the only keys that I had were the keys to the suitcase, right? <laughs> I didn't have a car or a house. Uh, and you've got to find somewhere to live, and then you've got to go down to Target and buy a kettle. And it, it, it is just, it is a, a huge step for people to take, isn't it? Massive. And your parents, I think, it wasn't easy. You lived in Western Sydney. How, how, did they speak English? Well, they um, came to Australia and uh, in preparing us to come, I still remember and have vivid memories, even though I was only seven, uh, my dad actually putting up a wallpaper in my sister and uh, my room with the alphabet. And each night <laughs> we would recite the alphabet, practice saying uh, very, very simple English phrases like good night, mama, good night, papa. Um, and uh, when we arrived in Australia, my parents did take some English lessons. But of course, because they had a young family to feed. My dad got a job very quickly uh, in the excavation industry. 
So it was very difficult to start with and uh, I remember the kindness of our neighbours, you know, some, some of the neighbours who, whose children also went to the same school, um, things like interpreting school newsletters um, and saying to my parents, okay, so tomorrow is Mufti Day, uh, just make sure that you don't put your children in school uniforms. Uh, inviting us to very, very Aussie traditional, um, you know, <laughs> events like pool parties. I mean, we'd never ever gone to a pool party before um, and, and uh, spending Christmas during summer, that was a very foreign concept to us as well um, and uh, everyone was very very welcoming but of course underneath um, you can't help but realize that you're the only one who looks like you you know you're, you're in a room full of people who all seem to look very much like each other and, and you're the odd one out um, and, it, and it can be intimidating it can be very intimidating and I think that's why you know if you look at multicultural Australia today it's something that I'm really proud of because I look around and it does look different from when I first arrived back in the 80s and, uh, and you know, I think that's a great thing for Australia. Th th that's something of course where your my experience will differ um, I mean I could pass for Australian until I, until I open my mouth at any rate but, um, <laughs> but tell me what I mean you know, of course, there's this widespread view that Australians are dreadfully racist and they discriminate people with, against people who look different or come from a different background. I, you must have had that experience, but it, you know, broadly, did you do you think Australia is like that, or do you think broadly most people behave in properly? Yeah. Oh, look, I think that um, on the whole, most people are excited and um, open to learning about different cultures. I think that, I think I genuinely do still think that that's broadly what uh, people do consider when they see people who look different or sound different and talk differently. And, um, and my dad always taught me from when I was a very young age that if there is a person who is making racist remarks uh, or m ignorant remarks, if you will, then it's that one person's you know, views. It's don't let that colour our experience and views of trying to fit into Australian society. And I think that held me in good stead because I've always taken people as they are uh, individually as opposed to, you know, sort of going, that's it, you know, um, these people are all racist and, and I hate this country or, or anything like that. And um, I have to, you know, take my hat off to my parents who always instilled that positive attitude and uh, you know, taught us to look at everyone um, in the best frame of mind first and foremost, uh, unless they proved otherwise. Now, when I was growing up as a kid, I think one of the great influences, certainly on my philosophy and on my politics, uh, was the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc, which, of course, at those da those days was pretty dominant in Eastern Europe, and there was a there was a, you know, a genuine iron curtain separating essentially a free liberal democracy, free liberal democracies in the West capitalist countries where free markets reigned and then the command economy authoritarian uh, on, 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 on in the east now uh, i i think that for people that have grown up in the last generation say in the last 30 years of course that's all ancient history but for koreans it's still a present part isn't it it's part of your present experience uh, do you think that that sort of sharpens your appreciation of freedom or, or alternatively, the difference between a tyranny and an authoritarian country and a free country? Yeah, certainly. I mean, each and every one of us are shaped by our life experiences. And having grown up in Korea and um, whilst I didn't uh, live through the Korean War, for example, my father was born during the Korean War. And uh, my father grew up in an era where Korea was seen as a very, very poor country before it went through the economic boom in, in the 80s. And so that life experience and that journey, I think, embeds something very, very deep inside you in terms of making sure that you work hard um, and making sure that you contribute what you can to your society and making sure that you leave your mark uh, in our world. And I think that's clearly had an influence on myself and my sisters as well. So you left home at the age of 18, I think, to come to Canberra uh, to study uh, law and uh, Asian studies at the ANU. Um, was that when you started to get formally interested in politics? <laughs> in short, no. Really? It's funny, yeah, because like, you involved in yeah, no, politics. no, I wasn't actually. It was quite funny because I think people just assumed that I, that I was. And uh, studying law, I think, probably gives you that uh, interest as well, that edge. But um, whilst politics 
on a whole was part of our lives because my dad always wanted us to make sure that we kept up to date with current affairs, what's happening and, and why are certain people acting in this way and what are the decisions that are being made that impact all of us. In that global sense, we always were, uh, I suppose, involved uh, in a certain way, but party politics was very foreign to us. Um, and I, if I think back now, and I guess I didn't realise at the time, but I guess that also stems from the fact that my parents weren't very familiar with Australian politics. So the, the conversations around the dinner table would be very much on the more global scale in terms of why some leaders make these decisions as opposed to getting heavily involved in party politics per se. Um, and it's funny because when I first arrived in Australia and, uh, you know, as a kid, you sort of see on TV and for me politics... Uh, Australian politics was so foreign. It was very, very foreign. Um, you know, uh, Bob Hawke was the Prime Minister at the time and, uh, you know, very flamboyant character as, as we all know. And so at the time there was a nostalgia that was attached and my parents were told, because they didn't know any better, um, oh yes, well, you know, you're working class and working class vote Labor. That's, that's what they were told. And, and, and of course, when you're not familiar with Australian politics, you sort of just go, oh, okay, this is what we do. And so um, that had sort of been cemented in, in my parents' minds for a long time. And it was only when we started to get to know Australia, get to know our community, get to know what contributions we were starting to make, that we started to open our eyes to, to what politics was. But even as a university student, I didn't get involved really. And it was not until 2010 when I was 30 that I actually joined the Liberal Party. And um, yeah, and that's when I started to actually get a bit more heavily involved with party politics. Because it used to be accepted wisdom that, that migrants naturally voted Labor. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, I think we've come to realise that maybe that wasn't always true, but certainly as people are here a bit longer. Um, another obvious question, I suppose, but why is it that so many migrants uh, find themselves more comfortable with the philosophy of the Liberal Party? Yeah, I think one of the things that what we have seen is gone from Labor being this party apparently for the working class through to Labor actually being this party for uh, the exclusive class, i.e. either the union movement or, or whatever it might be. The other thing is also migrants, on the whole, they're aspirational. And I think that the liberal philosophy actually blends very well with that. It's about reward for hard work and migrants generally tend to, uh, you know, fall into that category where they've made all the sacrifices to come to this new country and they work hard to uh, try and have the same opportunities and, and they should, you know, have the reward that comes from the hard work that they put into it. I think the other aspect is also there that um, as despite appearances of Labor being, uh, you know, more inclusive and diverse about uh, cultures and, and what have you, it's actually the Liberals who champion freedom that genuinely respect different cultures, different religions and different worldviews. And I think um, when migrants start to realise that, that's why they've started to back and support the Liberal Party. So as a party that's naturally comfortable with diversity, you, you put Liberal ahead of Labor. Yeah, it's, it's funny because again, Labor are very good, and especially at the ACT level, they're very good at talking the talk and they talk the talk until they're blue in the face about how they are the champions of diversity and, and inclusion. And uh, you know, from what I can see, that's what it is, it's just talk. You know, when you look at the record of the Canberra Liberals in attracting and electing, in electing, the diversity of the members that we see around the party room, there is no doubt that the Liberal Party is kicking way above what the Labor Party is doing in terms of supporting, mentoring and getting elected members from a diversity of cultures, of gender of course, but also life experiences. And that is so important for our elected members because it is a privilege being the voice for being an advocate for, being a representative for your community. And the more diversity we can see amongst our elected members, the better our democ democracy will be. Um, identity politics, uh, again, this, this new phrase, people take an identity, an ethnic identity, a gender identity, um, sexual orientation, all these things, and, and say, well, this is me, I'm part of this. And it becomes the defining thing for them. Now, you could claim a couple at least of those, uh, 
but I don't think we as liberals think about it in the same way. Do we? It's not what defines us. In you know, it's part of us, sure, but it's not what defines us. Would you agree with that? I absolutely do. And it's funny because I was actually reflecting on this only uh, over the last couple of weeks when people have started to talk about, obviously, my, you know, being the first um, uh, Asian Australian leader of a major party and all of that type of thing. And uh, and I realised this is the thing about being an Asian Australian that non-Asian Australians would never even had to think about and that is I was elected by my constituents to be their voice. I wasn't elected to be the Asian Australian voice and and so it's something that I'm very conscious of because of course as we know you know uh, perception becomes reality in in politics and so I'm conscious of that but at the same time I'm very proud of my um, heritage. I know that I bring an experience and a worldview that is probably going to be different from, uh, you know, non-Asian Australians. And so I think that's important. But um, I think it's also important to realise that when we bring our voices to the table, it's not because we're doing it just solely on behalf of Asian Australians. We're doing it because the diversity of voices in decision-making forums is a good thing, full stop. Now, one of your last, in, in the last um, uh, ACT Parliament, you, one of your portfolios was, was a, as a shadow, uh, uh, it was for disability. And I think you, you're you quite passionate about remembering that we as Liberals are not just about helping ourselves, we're about helping those who are unable, for whatever reason, to take full care of themselves. Uh, Give me your thoughts on that. Do we need to be more rounded in our approach as Liberals and less focused on you know, the bottom line, the budget, and more focused on our responsibility to those around us and in the essential equal dignity of every human being? I think it's more a PR problem because my experience, having been a member of the Liberal Party and now privileged to be an elected member, is that we have always looked after those who may not be in a position to do it for themselves and that government resources should be prioritised to support those who cannot. And uh, that that's always been, I suppose, where my uh, value uh, has life, um, has um, resonated with the Liberal Party. So I think it's more of a PR problem than anything else. And uh, I certainly, having come from a background of, I suppose, as you said, you know, sometimes it ticks off all those uh, minority groups, if you like, which, you know, I don't like to see myself as one, but, you know, if you look at it uh, from that perspective. And having been a voice for especially younger uh, migrant women, I think that we are very generous in spirit, but it's also about innately respecting the individual. And I think that's the, the core part of why I um, uh, am a Liberal. It's also about uh, making sure that when we do introduce programs to help people, we actually help them. We're not just helping those who provide the services. And I worry about this particularly with the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So it's a wonderful scheme, right? But uh, in the last budget, we learned that it may soon cost as much as Medicare. Well, that's a lot of money. And is that money being, how can we ensure that that's actually spent on the people in need and, 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 and is being spent, isn't being siphoned off elsewhere? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as, as a Liberal, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, we're in a strong economic position to be able to fund programs that are necessary, like the NDIS. And th there are no easy answers to these questions and priorities will always, uh, you know, come to a head in terms of what can you pay for and what must be paid for. Um, and so it is about making sure that we take everyone on the journey with us, you know. Are we making sure that when we develop policies, we're talking to every single stakeholder? Are we going, all right, back to basics, is it actually achieving what we want it to achieve? And that is to provide the autonomy and the dignity uh, to people with a, living with a disability so that they have the same opportunity as those who do not. And I think, you know, when I get into a bit of a quandary about certain policy issues, I always try and go back to that, you know, is it actually achieving its purpose and is it going to, uh, you know, level the playing field, if you like, for, for everyone. For the, for the sake of those who aren't in the ACT and don't follow the politics as closely as you do, uh, the ACT elections were held last year. You went from, uh, you lost two seats, I yes. think. You went from 30? 11 to 9. 11 to 9. The government went from... Actually, funnily enough, 12 to 10 Labor Party, but the Greens, who picked up uh, four extra seats, so they now have six, have formed a, a, an alliance with the Labor Party uh, to give them a majority.
So this is, this is what I'm coming to. I mean, mm. uh, uh, primary vote for primary vote, it's not impossible for you to match or even beat Labour. Mm -hmm. But you do have this, this big green vote here. And at the last election, it seemed to... green The green representation has gone shooting up from two to six. Does that tell us something about Canberra moving to the left or... What's going on? Yeah, I mean, and there'll be lots and lots of theories about why that's happened. My gut feel is that Labor are on the nose and the Canberra public were sick of them. I mean, that's evident from the fact that they lost two seats. This is in the middle of a pandemic where mm. every other government, an incumbent government, was returned, either with additional seats or at least kept the ones that they had. And this government actually, or this Labor Party, actually lost seats. Um, but obviously, for whatever reason it was, they were not prepared to give us a go and they went for the alternative. So um, I've also had a lot of people say to me, oh, we didn't know where to put it, so we voted Greens. So there's gonna be other theories, I'm sure, but uh, I hope and I believe that this isn't Canberra swinging further to the left. I think that it is Canberra saying, we need a change. We weren't quite prepared to give you a go last time. And that's where uh, you know my job is to convince them for the next election that they should be coming to us. Here's a good omen. The last time Canberra Liberals elected a woman as leader, uh, they, they went into government. Yes, Kate Carnell. they did, they did. Uh, so I hope to emulate that. <laughs> so how, how are we going to do it? How, I mean, at some stage, you are going to have to appeal not just to traditional Labor people, mm. not just to traditional Liberal voters, you know, tradesmen, workers, those kind of people, but also to a, at least a percentage of the public servants. You're going to have to win them over. How do you do that as a Liberal? Yeah, it's um, always a difficult challenge and a balancing act, of course, and you can't be everything to everybody. Uh, you know, that's a sh surefire way to lose if you try and do that. Uh, and you need to be authentic, and, and I will always, always, uh, you know, make sure that I do uh, to the best of my ability. Um, but it's also not all about me. So the great thing about having a great diverse team is that uh, we bring to this assembly a, a plethora of ex life experiences, expertise, professional expertise that Labor Party just do not. Uh, but also in terms of the diversity you see uh, in um, ethnicity and gender, uh, age groups even. Um, so I think that's a really, really important thing. But it's also about getting myself out there. And I do genuinely believe that most Canberrans want a good, sensible government from their ACT government. They want a government that is not going to be out to the fringes, either left or right. They want a government that makes good decisions based on sound fiscal management policies and that is going to just help people. At the end of the day, I think that's what they want from their government and it's my job to ensure that they know that's what we will do for them. A question about women in politics. <laughs> uh, Topical. <laughs> Very topical, but but uh, in a way, here in the ACT, you're, you're leading the way, aren't you? You've got an all-female leadership team, you and your deputy. Yeah. Um, you've also got a very bal well-balanced uh, team. Um, so I guess my question is, what's the problem, right? It, 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 where's the glass ceiling? If, if somebody like you, uh, just by having a go, getting involved through your sheer talent and personality, can come to be the leader of your party in, in the ACT, Where's the problem? Yep. And the ACT, I think, has always sort of led the way when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, being showing the way when it comes to uh, women. Uh, you know, obviously, you mentioned Kate Carnell earlier, and she was the first conservative leader um, uh, of, uh, of uh, any government or opposition. And, um, you know, and she's someone that I look up to and, and still take a lot of mentoring from. Um, and not only did we get majority female in our party room this election, but we actually achieved it last time as well in the last term. And, uh, you know, when you look at the numbers, they don't lie, Nick. You know, you look at the numbers in terms of our party room that's nine and we've got five um, uh, females and four, four, four men. But you actually got to look further than that. And that is in the election as candidates. We put up nine women. Five of those nine women were elected. We put up 16 men four out of the 16 men were elected. So not only did the party elect good women to stand for the Liberal Party, but the general public clearly want to see women in leadership roles. They clearly want to see women in leadership roles. And I think the hair clerk system actually allows people who may want to vote a certain party to actually say, you know what, within this party, 
I'm going to go vote for the women candidates because they have a choice of multiple candidates. And that's clearly been made out in the numbers. They don't like. And uh, if you look at the Labor and Green side, you can see something similar happening uh, as well. So what's your vision for Canberra when you become Chief Minister, as I'm confident you will? <laughs> uh, how will Canberra be different? under you than it has been for the last 20 years under Labor. Yeah, I think that when you have a look at the track record of Labor and the Greens over the last 20 years, it is actually disgraceful. There is absolutely no doubt that this government has lost touch. And what I've been saying, because it is so true, and I've been thinking about this for a while, is that they've lost heart. When you have a look at their woeful record in terms of health, education, public housing, you know, cost of living, even talking about Indigenous incarceration rates, they have absolutely made it clear that they have either lost the will or lost the heart to do anything about it. What I want to see for Canberra is a much better connected capital. It is our national capital and it should be a city that is befitting of that, but we must also remember that it is the home to people. And so whilst it's always great and we embrace the national institutions, we also want to make sure that it is the home for so many Canberrans and not just public servants. Whilst they're important, we want to make sure that Canberra is the city that people actually go to to realise their dreams. They shouldn't have to leave here and go to New York or to Sydney or, or anywhere else, but have everything that is here so that they can achieve their goals no matter what it is. And that's the city that I would like to see for our national capital. Elizabeth Lee, uh, leader of the Canberra Liberals, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.